The title slide, um, some of you will notice, has a, has a significant error in it. Um, it talks about the 22nd of June 2000. I did this because I was kind of making, a, making the point that if I was giving this presentation 17 years ago, this is the kind of picture I would have put on the title slide because that's where all the focus was. It was on the lake. And that's where the science was being done. That's where all the thinking was being done about the state of the environment and, and what was needed to fix it. But today, I prefer to use a picture like this. And obviously, with this picture, we still have the lake in the foreground because the lake is kind of the receiving environment for everything that happens in that catchment. But everything is connected, and all the things that are happening right up from the foothills to the Southern Alps down to the edge of the lake uh, is impacting on, on the system as a whole. So now we have a much more kind of integrated view of things. We think of catchment science as a kind of a, a holistic, unified way of looking at the world, and I think that's a much better way and it's helping us kind of unravel some of, the, some of the quite difficult and complex issues associated with the lake and its catchment. So what I'm going to do is kind of just probably wander around a bit. I'm going to talk about some of the issues. I'll talk about water quality and quantity. I'll say a little bit about groundwater and surface water. And I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the changes that have taken place in the catchment uh, over the last 50 years, um, some of those which have helped shape the the environment that we have now, and say a little too about, about, about the economy um, and, the, and the kind of social fabric of the, um, of the catchment. And leave you with a little message, I think, about complexity and uncertainty and how we, how we make our way through that um, in the weeks, months and years ahead, I guess. So there's a, um, uh, there's a picture of um, the catchment. Uh, that catchment is around about 2,600 square kilometres. Um, and about 200 square kilometres of that is the lake itself. So the lake make, makes up a significant proportion of the area of the catchment. Um, and the plains uh, account for about 75%. Um, so um, it's interesting, and I'll just talk a little bit about the geography of the catchment to try and kind of put this in context. Um, we think of the catchment as having kind of four distinct geographic regions. So you've got, right at the top end, you've got the headwaters of the Selwyn and its tributaries in those foothills, uh, the foothills ranges of the Southern Alps. So that's one region. And then you've got um, the plains, which we talked about. You've got the coastal area, the lake, and, and, the, and the coastal zone between Banks Peninsula and the Rakai River. And then you've got the, um, the foothills of of Banks Peninsula that face um, the, the, the plains. Now those, those regions are quite distinct and they all have kind of features that impact on um, the climate and geology um, of the catchment. And I've just got some, um, some comment there about um, uh, the climatic regions which correspond to those. And those, those numbers on the right hand side there are, are kind of average rainfall figures. So you'll see there's a fair bit of variety um, from um, from the, 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 the hills at the top, where you're getting about 600 millim 1,600 millimetres of rain down to um, the lake edge where it's more like 650. And then again, on the Banks Peninsula hills, it's pretty variable, but in places up to 1,500 millimetres. One of the things, too, that's kind of interesting about this, this, this catchment is it was developed very early by European settlers. And of course, you know, I'm also very conscious, and particularly listening to Liz um, before me, about the fact that well, I might have had, um, you know, 30 years of sort of kind of, you know, wading around in the lake for various purposes, that Naitahu have a relationship that goes back 65 generations. You know, it's hard for us to kind of even get our heads around what that kind of association means and how important that sense of place is um, to people who've, for whom the lake has been a food basket for that period of time. Anyway, um, the landscape when Europeans arrived was very much one of tussock grasslands right over the plains, but very swampy, as they would call it, uh, around the edge of the lake. And they actually started work on fixing that very early. So in the 1860s, you started to see the first work on drainage and the straightening of rivers. Rivers were straightened because of flooding issues um, in the lower part of the catchment. Um, and 
and, and drainage works were carried out because the, the soils around the lake were very fertile and there was value from an agricultural point in, in removing water as fast as they could from them. And the other thing is that they actually started thinking about using water, not just getting rid of it, but using it quite early on. I mean, they were hand digging wells probably in the 1860s, in the 1880s, and they were starting work on some of the, the net, that network of, of water races that crisscross the plains and provide and have provided for, for over 100 years water for, for drinking and for, uh, and for stock watering purposes. So it's kind of got a very long history of environmental modification, uh, particularly with sort of agricultural purposes in mind. I thought I'd just say a little bit about the kind of different types of water bodies you see in the catchment, because they're quite distinct, and they all have their own features, and they all have their own kind of management demands. So top left is a picture of the upper Selwyn. Um, bottom left uh, is, is the Selwyn at Coes Ford, so that's the, the, the lower Selwyn, perhaps in, in, in better days than we see it now sometimes. Top right is a Banks Peninsula stream. That's the Kaituna. That's the ECAN recorder at the Kaituna. So that's flowing off the western slopes of, of Banks Peninsula, and, and those streams are interesting because... For example, they carry more concentrations of phosphorus than the spring-fed streams do. And then bottom right is one of the many little drains, well, I guess we call them, we can call them drains because they've been straightened, spring-fed that flow directly into the lake. There's about 40 plus of these right around the perimeter of the lake. Um, now, hydrologically, they're all quite different. Um, so, for example, streams like Kaituna and Selwyn under flood conditions carry many many more times water than they do um, under average conditions. So, for example, there's the flood in the Kaituna. Um, I've seen that a couple of times in the Selwyn. Um, that's, um, uh, that's a significant flood uh, in, the, in the 1980s, I think. But those spring-fed streams have very stable flows. So that's that stream under flood conditions, and the flow is probably only a couple of times the median flow there. Uh, and that, that kind of has, impl has, has implications, for example, in terms of the way contaminants accumulate in those water bodies and the way they're flushed out. So there's a lot of variability there. Um, let's talk about what's been happening over the last, I guess the last 30 or 40 years in terms of the changes to some of those streams. So this is, a, well, on the right-hand side is a picture of a dry Selwyn riverbed. Now, we know that the Selwyn in its middle reaches is often dry. Uh, the question is, is it drier for longer and for a greater extent than it has been in the past? And the, the graph on the left is a graph of um, the lowest flows recorded each year in the Selwyn at Coes Ford going back to 1985. And you can see there that there's a pretty clear trend of declining flow over that period of time. And there's been all sorts of arguments, you know, over the years about whether that's caused by climate or whether that's caused by abstraction. And I think we've done enough analysis now to be able to say that, yes, there is actually a climate effect there, but there is also a very strong effect from abstraction. So you're seeing that decline. And, of course, last year, or last summer, um, we, had Coes, we had the river at Coes Ford, Coes Ford actually dry uh, for the first time for a very long time. So that's the kind of thing that's happening in terms of flows. What about, what about water quality? And I'm going to use Coes Ford again as an example because it's kind of like a, you know, it's a bit of a flagship stream for um, the catchment. Certainly the media um, like to talk about Coes Ford, especially when it looks like that. Um, that graph is a graph of nitrate nitrogen concentrations that have been sampled uh, when the flow is low, below 2 cumex. And the reason that it's been sampled then is because then you are actually sampling groundwater. You're not sampling water that's, that's flown directly down the river channel um, from the mountains. You're actually, you're actually sampling water that's percolated through the gravels and come back up and appeared probably somewhere around about Chamberlain's Ford or upstream of Chamberlain's Ford and come down through, through to Coes Ford. So what you are seeing there over, over a period of 30 years is actually... Um, quite a measurable increase in nitrate concentrations. And if you look at um, other um, of those, those streams that flow into the lake, you'll see similar patterns. For example, Hearts Creek is one where we've, we've seen a very similar pattern. How important is this? How significant is it? Well, it's kind of important on a number of different levels. We know that 
Nutrients like nitrogen or phosphorus can create problems, can create problems in streams at high concentrations. Nitrogen is actually toxic to aquatic life. At lower concentrations, it can help feed problems like you see there, um, particularly in association with things like warm temperatures and low flows and that kind of thing. So it's really important at that level. It's also kind of important politically. Earlier this year, the OECD uh, produced a performance in, uh, or undertook a perform an environmental performance assessment of New Zealand and published a report, I think it was back in April. And in that report, they um, noted that New Zealand's rate of, of, of nitrogen surplus, the rate at which our surpluses were increasing, so that's nitrogen losses to the environment, was the fastest of all of the OECD countries. So kind of that's a very European way of looking at the world, of course, but um, nonetheless, it sort of kind of puts us on the map in a, in a, in a bad kind of way, um, and we need to be cognizant of those sorts of issues. And there's a lot of effort going on right now, and we'll be going on this catchment about how we can deal with problems like nitrogen and phosphorus so that we can reverse those sorts of trends that we see there. And then there's groundwater, of course. Unfortunately, I couldn't kind of zoom right in on the Selwyn Waihora zone without completely losing definition, because they're screenshots. Um, but if you look at Selwyn Waihora there, and it's actually quite, quite interesting to have the other zones for comparison. On the plot on the left, we're looking at um, concentrations recorded probably um, uh, spring of last year, which is when they do the annual um, sampling around. Um, if the dots are blue or green, that means the concentrations recorded in those wells are less than half the drinking water standard. So they're, they're kind of the good guys. Um, if they're brown or red, um, they're over half. If they're red, they're actually over the standard. So they're kind of non-complying from a drinking water point of view. So you can see for those wells in, in this zone, there are a couple there that um, exceed that drinking water standard. Now, I'm not sure whether they're water supply wells or not, but they're showing it's sort of a kind of a general picture. Compare that with Ashburton, where you've got similar kinds of land uses, I guess, and you can see there are quite a few more red dots. The, the map on the right um, is actually showing trends, you know, what are we seeing over time? So what's happened over the last 10 years to those concentrations? Okay, so you'll see the little, the, the, the little red arrowheads represent wells where on the basis of annual sampling, we're seeing an increase um, over time. And blue are those that are kind of staying the same, which is kind of an interesting statistical concept. And the green ones are ones we're actually seeing an observable improvement in, in, in other words, a reduction in nitrogen concentration. So you'll see that the reds kind of outweigh the greens by a significant margin. In fact, at least 30% of the of the wells in that zone are showing increases. Now, some of them are coming off a very low base. In other words, the, the concentrations are actually still quite low, but the point is that they're moving up. So what does that mean? Where are they going to get to? What's the significance of that? How do we manage that over time to avoid uh, adverse effects? Because, of course, that groundwater is the water that you see in those spring-fed streams when they drain into the lake. So ultimately, that, those nutrients are supplying the lake. So that's kind of uh, the groundwater quality um, point of view or perspective. Um, swimmability is, is a very hot topic um, at the moment nationally. Um, we've seen um, a significant policy initiative from the government this year about improving um, swimmability. They've suggested that they'd like to see 90% of New Zealand's water bodies suitable for swimming by, I guess, 2045 or something, 2040. 80% by, by 2035, um, coming off a, a base of about 43% um, now. What's the situation like in, in the Selwyn Waihora catchment? Well, we've got five sites that are measured routinely for, for E. coli concentrations, which is a measure of suitability for swimming. And you'll see that um, two of them have got green dots, which means that they are, they are okay for swimming. The orange dots mean the water quality is poor. The red dot means it's very poor. So we're not doing very well there, two out of five. That sounds like 40%, which is kind of like the national average, actually, but well below where, where in a policy sense, anyway, we need to go. And the red triangle in the middle of the lake with the little exclamation mark on it is there because there's an algal bloom 
uh, in the lake, which makes it unsafe for swimming from another point of view. And we now have signs like this, and that again is, is kind of codes forward, which is uh, an information board about the presence of potentially toxic algae. And I use the word potentially because the algae they're talking about there are not always toxic, but you know, you know, do you really want to take the risk of, um, of, of it being so at the time? So in that case, you'll see the, the little indicator arrow is around at the, the high risk end. So that's kind of a, um, a, a disturbing trend. I, I guess the other thing I should say is that this, just, this isn't a problem just for the Selwyn River, and it's not just a problem for the zone, and it's not just a problem for, for Canterbury. It's actually a national problem. You know, we are seeing this more and more in a number of places, uh, the proliferation of these kind of um, uh, unwanted blooms of, of cyanobacteria. So let's talk about the lake. Uh, which is at the bottom end of the system and is connected to all the other bits and pieces. Uh, the background picture I kind of like because that's, that's the lake in bloom and you can see it's got that kind of muddy green, um, fairly unappetising kind of uh, look to it. I've said, you know, deterioration question mark because we don't have the data that demonstrates that water quality has got worse over time. That doesn't mean to say that it hasn't been getting worse over time. It just means that our record doesn't go back far enough. And you can see, you can see there um, some data from um, goes from 2001 to 2016. And that's an annual assessment of something called the Lake Trophic Index. Now that is an index that's that's developed by combining a number of different measurements into a kind of an overall figure that gives gives us an understanding of the status of the lake in terms of its fertility, the degree to which it's enriched. And you can see that over that 15-year period, it's kind of been reasonably um, stable. I mean, it's gone up and down. There was a big dip in, in 2012 when we had a, um, a very high lake over the summer. But it stayed pretty stable, but it's actually, those, the top of those bars are uh, in that yellow zone, which is what we call the hypertrophic zone. It's not really where you want to be. Um, and we estimate that historically, the lake was probably sitting, you know, two or three points below that, somewhere between four and five. So at some stage uh, in the past, we've seen a kind of deterioration in water quality. We've got lots of anecdotal evidence about the lake being much clearer and much cleaner in appearance in the past. Um, one thing, though, I think, I'd, you know, is worth noting is that, is that Sometimes people will tell you that, that Waihora, Lake Ellesmere, is dead. In fact, uh, back in about 2005, we had a, there, was a, there was a reasonably celebrated, if that's the right word for it, environment court case involving Environment Canterbury and, and some uh, developers who wanted access to quite large amounts of groundwater. And the judge at the time decided he'd go down to the lake and have a look for himself. And he reported on the basis of his visit that you know, it didn't look to be in particularly good shape. You know, the riparian margin of the lake was in, was, was in poor shape. Um, there were issues with stock access. The water didn't look good, and he said it was in a kind of a serious state. And that got converted into the, in the media to a statement that, you know, the lake is dead, biologically. And then someone in Parliament used the same expression, and it kind of got bandied around, and it became the kind of, you know, alternative fact that we hear about these days. Um, and, and uh, the Waihora Ellesmere Trust and ECAN established the, the Living Lakes Symposium series in, I think, 2009. And the title Living Lake was kind of a reference to this idea that the lake was dead, because, of course, it's not. It's kind of a highly productive lake. lake. There's a lot, lot of life in there, but that doesn't mean that it's in good shape. Uh, but there are a number of values that are supported by the lake in its, in its current state. OK. Um, one of the most important kind of um, factors in, in the appearance of the lake and the quality of the, of the lake environment that's gone now and has been gone for a long time are these things here. So this is an aerial photo taken in the early 60s, just off Timber Yard Point. And what you're looking at in the middle there are these, are these huge beds of floating weeds, rupia which were kind of rooted in the, in the, in the sediments in the, um, in the lake bed and grew up through the water column and just kind of spread out like a vast mat um, over the surface of the water. And 
They were kind of a nuisance in some respects. In fact, you can see fishermen there have actually cut a channel through the weeds. It must have been hell trying to get to their eel nets uh, when these things were kind of sitting around the edge of the lake. But they had a very important ecological function. Well, two functions, really, in a sense. One was that they provided a tremendous amount of habitat, cover, food supply for fish and birds. You know, a vast resource like that. And secondly, they anchored the bed of the lake so that the water between the shore and the lake was largely free of that sort of suspended sediment that you see today. So people walking around the edge of the lake could actually see their footprints in the water. In the, in, in the bed, they could actually see through the water column. So it looked a lot better than it does now. So we think that's kind of that was a fairly kind of cataclysmic moment in the in the in the ecological history of the lake when in 1968 uh, the Wahini storm came along. You know, unprecedented sort of size and ferocity, and it ripped those we those weed beds out, blew them to the shore where they sort of sat in great piles and rotted unpleasantly over a long period of time and they've never really successfully regenerated. And later on in this seminar series, you'll hear about efforts that are underway now to re-establish those beds uh, because of the importance of the function that they, they fulfilled in the, in the lake. I want to say a bit about some of the kind of changes and pressures that we see in the environment. Um, and the, I guess I, I'm drawing an association between land use change and water quality effects. Although I would repeat the, the point I made earlier that some of the changes that we've seen in the lake have occurred over a very long period of time. But if you wanted to sort of think about the way land use has changed over time, here's an interesting picture. Um, this is a series of aerial, aerial photos, I must be talking to you there, um, taken at Tiparita. In fact, that, that picture is... Um, Taken, it's the intersection of Charlins Road and Tiparita Road, for so those of you who know the area. Uh, and in 1956, there was nothing there, just stones. And you can see the, um, the old riverbed you know, running across the, the lower third of that picture. Um, but interesting things happened over time. So by the 1980s, it looks like this. So we've seen quite a bit of land development. And we've seen that classic Canterbury Plains checkerboard pattern um, appearing now um, as the land's been um, divided, subdivided, and, and worked over um, and fenced. And then between the 1980s and the 2000s, we see this. And you'll see that those kind of rectangular paddocks have been replaced by kind of wedge-shaped ones because of the development of centre pivot irrigation in that, in that catchment. So, uh, you know, again, an intensification of land use over time. Now, you may wonder what those white worm-like things are in that picture. Um, and I'd made the assumption that they were kind of, you know, it was silage wrap or something like that. But when you think about it, the scale of the thing's just not right for that. There are actually marks on the photo that indicate where shelter belts have been removed. So that was kind of one of the consequences of irrigation development in those areas, uh, was that shelter, and I think you can see the marked in the, in the middle picture, uh, was removed to accommodate the, the irrigators. So that's kind of a fundamental change you see in one part of the catchment, and of course that's repeated over a number of parts. And you can, um, you can get a sense of this in this, in this picture here, which is um, um, a series of kind of um, plots uh, indicating the number of farmers or the number of farms that are identified as a particular land use type between 2000 and 2015. So it's based on, a, on the agri-base you know, farming census. And if you look at the left-hand one, that kind of lime green one, you'll see that's, that's uh, sheep and beef and deer. And you'll see that over that 15-year period, that's gone from making up, say, 60% or a bit more than 60% of, of all farms in the catchment to a bit over 40%, so, so a significant reduction there. And then the blue bit in the middle is the increase in dairying, which has kind of um, mirrored that, where you've gone from maybe 10% to well over 20% of farms. Um, the other ones that are kind of interesting, forestry, where you've seen a decline, perhaps not in, in quite that t same time zone, maybe that started before 2000, but also lifestyle blocks, which weren't really a feature of land use in the catchment in... Um, 
in 2000, but now make up a, you know, five or six percent of, of, of the land holdings there. Um, so that's been that's been quite a quite a fundamental change too. And you, you if you if you if you look at a picture of the distribution of land use now, it looks like this. Now this is in 2011. If you went back to um, uh, maybe 2000, uh, maybe 1980, you would see a significantly different picture. All of that blue, the light blue, which is dairying, and the and the um, I just move that down a bit. Um, and the darker blue, some, which is, some of which is support. Um, uh, that was confined to the margins of the lake and the heavier soils, the fertile heavier soils. But we've seen over that sort of 20 or 30 year period, we've seen that um, the development of, of um, dairying as a land use spreading right across the catchment. I, I, I wanted to say a little bit about, um, you know, the values of the catchment. Because this is what's really important, you know, when the community gets together and thinks about how it wants to use its resource, it's really thinking about the, the set of values that are important to it and the ones that ha and how they want to manage and protect them. So I've just listed a few of what could be a really long list here. I put Naitahu values at the top because of that point that I made earlier about this kind of long association with the lake and its importance. So, uh, that Liz was emphasising um, when, when she welcomed us um, uh, earlier on this evening. Um, the wildlife thing, I mean, you know, we, 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 we shouldn't forget that Waihora has a conservation order. It's been around for um, over 20, you know, 25 years now, 26, 27 years, recognising its outstanding qualities um, as a wildlife habitat. The, the, the diversity and abundance of bird life in and around Waihora is unparalleled in New Zealand. Um, and it's recognised internationally for those values. The lake was once a really, or the lake and the tributaries were once a really important fishery, a brown trout fishery. You see that picture down the, um, you know, two thirds of the way down the, the slide there, that's, that's the senior leadership team at Fish and Game um, conducting a trout census in, 2000, in, in 1910. And you can see lots of pictures like this. And I guess it's not the fact that they were obviously profligate in the way they, they, they harvested the resource. It's the fact that the biomass of trout was so huge. And again, we think, you know, and that, and that, and that has declined. I mean, if you think about recreational visits to the catchment, particularly around the lake, um, you know, whether it's hunting, shooting, fishing or whatever, we, we estimate that there were probably over 100,000 visitor days um, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, and that's declined to maybe 20,000 now. Um, <coughs> and again, the, the changes in the lake, the removal of the weed beds, probably had a significant effect on, on the fact that um, you can no longer, well, of course, you'd be a breach of your licence if you try to do that again, I suppose, but, but you know, the chances of doing it anyway um, are pretty slim. Finally, I wanted to say something about agriculture, because agriculture is really important in this catchment. And I would hate to think that you were listening to this talk and thinking, oh, he's really kind of just setting up a debate between the environment and farming, because it's certainly not my intention here. Um, and I want to say something about why farming is important. And I think the whole purpose, or one of the purposes of this series of talks, is that you will learn about the kind of attempts that are being made to try and see how we can kind of reconcile um, these, these uses and values um, in, a, in a way that... that you know, it's going to be tough for a lot of people, but, but we'll produce the kind of the best outcome for, for our communities as a whole. And agriculture is really important. Um, we can see that and, and the role that water has played in these, in these plots here. So the first one, and these are kind of estimates, I'd have to say, but you're looking at in that first plot um, an estimate of, of the rate of the, of, the, of the amount of irrigated land and how that's increased over time between 1990 and, um, and 2015. It's a wee bit strange because it sort of goes up and down and I think once you've started irrigating land you're, you're unlikely to stop it. So I think that's probably just a, a, an artefact of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a less than perfect data set but the trend is there. Same with the the lower figure, which is actually about the total consented amount of water. Um, believe it or not, it's actually quite difficult to find this sort of information out um, because of the, the complex nature of some resource consents. But generally speaking, there's the increase from, you know, nothing in, in, in the 1960s 
you know, right up to you know, this vast amounts of water um, in, the, in, in 2015. And that red line is kind of a, um, is an indication of what we understand to be kind of the sustainable extraction rate in, 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 the, um, in the catchment. Um, where we're at relative to that isn't necessarily well indicated by those bars because of some of the uncertainties in the, in the data, but there is no question that um, uh, we have approached the limits of sustainability in terms of water extraction. Okay, let's just talk about sort of Selwyn District and, and, and its economy um, and where it's at. So the plot on the top left is the, represents the total numbers of people who in, in the last census uh, declared themselves as being employed in agriculture, forestry and fishing. So you'll see a very high number in Selwyn, similar to Ashburton. You know, these are the kind of, you know, two very similar, two very similar zones in, in many respects. Higher than anywhere else in the, in the, in the, in the region, as we look at the other districts um, in the region. If you look at the unemployment rate in Selwyn, it's really low compared to pretty much everywhere else in Canterbury. Uh, and, and well below um, the New Zealand figure at that time. Same thing for median um, individual income, you'll see. So, that we're, you know, you, you're getting a picture here of a, um, of a district where there's a lot of activity going on and, and the flow of, of, or the generation of, of money in the, in, in the catchment significant compared to other parts of, of Canterbury and New Zealand. And part of that is driven by what you see in the, in the slide on the bottom right, which is population growth. I mean, the, the growth in Selwyn District has been phenomenal, and it's been going at a rapid rate ever since um, the district was sort of created in, in, in 1991 with the, with the reforms in, in local government. Going along with that, I, go, I guess, is, is, the, is, the, is the rate at which the economy is growing locally, and you'll see that um, GDP in Selwyn. And I didn't get this. I got this. Most of the information here I got from Stats NZ, but I, I got the, the GDP growth rate from uh, the Selwyn District website, um, which is a pretty trustworthy source, I'm sure. Uh, but they're, they're making the point that that, that rate is, is, is well above the New Zealand average and I suspect well above the average for other districts um, in Canterbury. So just a final thing on, on population growth, and I'm, I'm nearly done. Um, if you break it down a bit, and we have a breakdown in that, that plot at the top right-hand corner there, you look at every single settlement in Selwyn has been growing, and has been growing rapidly since, since at least um, 2000. When the, or 2001, which is the, which are the blue bars. The only one that's actually been going backwards is the Burnham military camp. Um, and I suspect that's got absolutely nothing to do with the local economy. But the interesting thing is that every settlement has grown. Um, obviously, spectacular growth in places like West Melton, Ralston, um, uh, Darfield to a lesser degree, and Lincoln. But every other, every other of those little settlements has continued to grow. And that's not a trend you see necessarily in rural New Zealand elsewhere. So indication again um, of a strong economy. The aerial photos at the bottom, which I got off the, the Canary Maps website, which is a great resource actually, um, are of Lincoln Township. So 1946, I think, is the left-hand one. 1980-something um, is the middle one. And then look at it today. You know, so you're seeing kind of a really interesting um, phenomenon in, in, in a New Zealand context, which is the, the rate of growth of these urban townships. And of course that brings its own resource management issues like water supply, sewage disposal and stormwater. All of those are part of the picture that you will hear about over the next few weeks when we have these seminars. Finally, I, I mentioned at the start I wanted to talk about complexity and uncertainty, and I just want to say a little bit about that, because this is kind of where we're at. Um, and back in, in the, in the mid-90s, um, some of us had a crack at describing um, the food web for the lake. So this is kind of a, a very, you know, ecology, you know, 101 kind of um, diagram where you, 
You, you identify all of the communities, including the human ones, the biological communities, and look at the re relationship, the relationships between them and how energy flows through that community. I mean, the overwhelming thing I take from that is, crikey, that's a bit complicated. You know, that's, I guess that's the point. It's a complicated system, and you've got to re remember that when you play around with it. But not content with the sort of biophysical world, we had to go a few years ago at um, describing the sort of social interactions in, 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 the, in the Selwyn um, a catchment, particularly in terms of the way, you know, the different agencies and uh, individuals, organisations, entities, regulators and so forth, um, inter interacted with each other. And, you know, when you look at that, you think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the biophysical view of the world, you know, because that's getting really complicated. Um, and, of course, this was very, a very real issue for us when we started work in the Selwyn Waihora Zone, and the Zone Committee started its job of determining how it would think about and the kind of recommendations it would make to ECAN about the rollout of, of um, uh, uh, contaminant limits in the catchment. You know, how would we determine what the limits of, of, of contaminant loss were and how they would be allocated amongst the different um, uh, generators of contaminants, I suppose, way to put it. So we actually had to come up with a system that enabled us to link a whole lot of different bits of information together. So this is the scheme, the schematic for that. Each of those boxes represents either a model or a decision support tool or a separate piece of analysis that got fed into a process that we asked the zone committee and the community to reflect on so that they could start to say, well, what happens if you poke it here? You know, what happens over there? And I guess that's the, the thing about this catchment. You know, there's lots of bits that can pop out all over the place if you don't um, think of this in a very coherent and, and holistic way. That's the message I want to leave with you, um, but also to make the point that over the next, I think it's every two weeks these seminars, isn't it? Okay, so, so over the next 12 weeks, um, what I'm hoping we'll see is some kind of clarity about this sort of stuff as we think about the aspirations we have for um, Selwyn Waihora and its catchment um, and what's planned, all of the different groups and agencies, how they've got together, the regulatory framework, the, the, the voluntary work that's going on, the whole raft of things that, that make up uh, the, the water and soil future of, of um, Selwyn Waihora. So thank you. Thank you.